Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Jerick Show. I'm Javad Malik. On today's action-packed episode, we have got zero days, more zero days, and bad practices or bad advice. Plus, we have a super, super cool guest. You don't want to miss this one. Welcome to The Jerick Show, featuring your hosts, Javad Malik and Eric Krohn. Timely topics, poorly presented. Eric, you're back. Welcome. I am happy to be here. It's another bright, beautiful day. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know what else to say, man. It is wonderful to be alive today. What do you think? Well, it's wonderful for me to be alive. Yeah, for you, I'm I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But we've got someone super cool uh, joining us today who uh, you, you may have heard of the uh, the company SensePost. And uh, Shaul was the CEO, but then they got swallowed up. Uh, I don't know if that's the right term to use, but they merged with uh, Orange, and now he's the head of research at OCD, not the dis- not obsessive compulsive disorder, but uh, Orange Cyber Defense. So, welcome, Shaul, to the show. <laughs> hi, hi, both. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. And you're all the way in uh, South Africa, am I right? In South in South Africa. Yes, I am. In fact, I'm all the way in Cape Town. In fact, I'm all the way on the southern peninsula of Cape Town. They they talk about us being south of the lentil curtain. So it's like where all the um, hippies and uh, escaped convicts live. And (laughs) basically as far as you can go before you run out of land. That's where Is, is, Is it a bit like Australia in that regard then? It's a lot like Australia in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> Escape convicts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've I've heard two 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 different accounts about Cape Town in in particular, uh, and these are from two friends. So one friend he went there on a holiday, and he ended up getting mugged. Um, oh, they so they came out of a restaurant, that. and and he got mugged. And another one, uh, he's a. Wasn't me. It, I, well, he said it was a, a white guy with a South African accent, so it could be uh, it could, could be you. It, it's it, you know <laughs> another one. He's a he's a Muslim, and he's always struggled during Ramadan to fast uh, during yeah because you have to fast from sunrise to sunset. You can't eat or drink, not even water. And uh, a few years ago, this is about seven eight years ago, he looked on the map, and one of the shortest days was in South Africa. The the hours is about eight or 10 hours between sunrise and sunset. So he just booked an Airbnb and he flew all the way over to Cape Town. <laughs> and he spent the whole month there. And he said it was the best experience of his life. He said the people were wonderful, the community was great. And uh, he, he made a bunch of like lifelong friends uh, after that. So So two sides of the same city. Which is it? Yeah, two sides of the same coin. You, you know, it's um, it's considered it's considered not very intellectual anymore to talk about the developed world and the developing world as if you've got these sort of two poles. You know, it's now considered more PC to talk about the sort of continuum between you know stage one and stage four economies. You know, where I think you guys both would uh, you know exist very solidly in a stage four you know developed economy, and South Africa probably has all. You know, sort of what m- makes us interesting, um, and and that's why it's really hard to answer questions about what it's like. You know, the, the questions like what is it like for who, and and when. Um, so those realities are both are both true. My my day to day life is is idyllic. I have a lovely apartment. We have electricity for a while, almost every day. Um, I can get really good coffee downstairs you know i go to the beach it's it's great and what 20 miles from here you can be in uh, in yanga which has got the highest murder rate in the in the world you know and you'll be living in a tent and shack and and walking through puddles of mud and um yeah and those things are just like this you know they, they just brush up against each other so you know if you sort of try and imagine that sort of existence that's that's kind of what it's like Wow, that, that's really enlightening. Yeah, see, the Jerick Show, come for the security, stay for the cultural politics. Uh, yeah, geopolitics. Anyway, let's jump straight into the stories of the week. And we start off with CVE 2021-1675. Eric, take it away. 
Yeah, so um, obviously this is a critical Windows principle or vulnerability. I know nothing else about it other than that, other than some of the cool memes I've seen this week of like <laughs> the Prince Spooler driving through a bus as a train, you know, stuff, some stuff like that. Um, but this, you know, this looks like another one of those. Um, it, there was a proof of concept released on this, it appears. Um, and so it is something that happens, but it's it's patchable. So that's my understanding on that. Um, and, and right down there, you can see on your screen, it's trying to help you. It's asking you, hi, are you looking for a solution to help manage vulnerabilities and reduce risk? That's very <laughs> nice of them to do that, Javad, so we don't have to worry about it since that's popping up. You should definitely answer yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so so th this, this vulnerability, I think, is almost more notable for its uh, drama, I think, than for its technical um, Im impact. The, the first bit of drama being that the, the researchers classified it differently to Microsoft. So they, they classified it as both a local privilege exploit and a remote uh, command execution. And Microsoft, when they um, addressed it in their patch last patch Tuesday, um, addressed it only as, as, as a local privilege exploit. And they've subsequently um, upgraded their, uh, their evaluation of it. The other drama is that these guys published the POC on GitHub uh, and then pulled it um, ostensibly ahead of their Black Hat talk. So they're getting sort of maximum pre-Black Hat um, airtime air for it. But as to its, um, you know, as to its impact, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to say. You, you can get system level privs remotely with it, but you have to have existing Windows creds already. And, um, and and you have to kind of abuse the, as I understand it, you have to drop a DLL uh, in a in a folder. And um, and that requires you to have, you know, some sort of privs to write to that machine and network access to be able to to do that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing the apocalypse here. I, I think it's, um, it will be used, you know, in lateral movement and privilege escalation if people don't patch. Uh, but for the most part, um, it's also generally uh, recommended to uh, to disable uh, the, you know the print the, the principal service, particularly on critical machines. Uh, it's audited for regularly. You know your 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 compliance checkers and things will look look for that behavior, and it's quite easily detectable like, through standard Windows events. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think this is going to change the world. My view. Oh. So now that the neighbor's uh, lawn mowing crew is gone, and I can actually speak without hearing uh, lawn mowers in the background, um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 that's kind of what I saw here too. Is that, that there? There seems to be a lot of noise about this, and I absolutely see it being useful if somebody gets into a system for you know uh, moving around laterally, like you said, maybe privilege escalation, things like that. But as far as just in general for the average machine um, in an in an organization, it doesn't seem like it's all that big a deal. But it it is getting a lot of it is getting quite a bit of press. Um, and I do mm. think it's kind of funny how um, how some of these vulnerabilities take off when and in fact they're not they're not as critical as people you know think they are or they make it sound sometimes uh, unless you have the right circumstances going on. Hmm. So, you know, it, it's interesting to me here in, in InfoSec how we've gotten to the point where, you know, we're building logos and web pages and names for exploits and vulnerabilities that, <laughs> that may or may not ever be used. I mean, this has been done as a POC, I know, um, but I don't know that there's active ones out there yet. Um, but it, it it's interesting to me how much we're, we're kind of like marketing some of these things. Um, and, and it's just funny. Hmm. Yeah. This this reminds me a lot of um, the WWE and uh, growing up watching it. Uh, it. It's influenced a lot of my behaviors. <laughs> that explains a lot, doesn't it? But you could either win the Royal Rumble to get a title shot, which is very difficult, or you could just hang around the backstage or underneath the ring and take a cheap shot at the champion, create a feud, and that would give you a title shot. And uh, this kind of thing, it's 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 really effective at um, at being a cheap shot at generating a lot of publicity, and and interest in you, your work, and and your upcoming black hat talk. So, uh, I'm not hating the player, I hate the game, but you know, well done <laughs> on 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 playing the game in that regard. Mm. So, uh, let's move on to the next. See, uh, uh, I might add, this could be a completely ransomware-free episode. Um, but um, hackers use zero day to mass wipe my book live 
devices. Um, uh, how are they going around doing that? Eric, you want to kick this off? So, yeah, and, and I love that picture in the top. How many times have we wanted to do that to a hard drive? Just like cut it cleanly <laughs> in half like that, right? Um, but yeah, this one basically, they're, they're, it appears being able to remotely run a reset on the the uh, NAS devices. This is, I think, Western Digital Live, uh, my book, Live NAS Devices. So they're connected to the network. These are the ones that a lot of people store their pictures and, and all that stuff on. And so what's happening is they're, they're invoking this factory reset script, which wipes everything and resets everything. Now, the question is, why are they doing this? Are they just jerks that are running around doing that? Um, one of the theories right now seems to be that uh, a lot of these are being used for botnets. And so what's happening is maybe some competitors or other botnets are going in and trying to wipe these out to uh, hurt the, the competition and or maybe trying to take them over themselves. Um, but this is interesting because this is a consumer level device. Again, we see mm -hmm. IoT and consumer level devices being targeted here. And these are going to be people that don't necessarily, they're not going to monitor the traffic coming from these. So that's why they make them, you know, they're good for botnets and stuff like that. The traffic's not going to be monitored. And people trust these devices to do their backups too, and to hold on to the pictures of their families and stuff like that. And then some jerk is out there nuking these things. So, you know, it's another one of those consumer level things that's uh, definitely taking a hit. Uh, my understanding is it's patchable, but how many consumers patch, right? Um, how often does that happen unless they're actually forced to do it through some sort of an app? And if you just pop that thing up on the network, plug it in and start dropping files on it, how do you know that it, it needs to be patched, right? Unless they mm. go out of their way. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. Charles, what do you think? You know, um, you, you know what I find interesting about this bug, and it's, it's a little bit of a confirmation bias, but um, we've been spending a lot of time, like me and my team, trying to understand you know, how the security landscape has changed for businesses because of the whole work from home thing. And one of the, one of the aspects that we think is kind of wholly underappreciated is the role that um, local home user LAN devices play in the, in the security question because of their ability to exploit DHCP. So, you know, one of the things that's interesting is you have a Linux device like this sitting on your home network and it's local to your home network. It's local to your, to your other devices. And you can start spewing out DHCP from this, uh, from these kinds of things. That's not what happened here, but you could. With DHCP, you, you can change the IP. You can change, obviously, the, the, the DNS. Where is it getting its DNS from? How does it resolve unqualified names? Um, you can change routes. You can set... Um, uh, PXE boot, you know, the, the, the boot, uh, what is it? You know, the boot P protocol. And, and so these things have actually in some, in, in, I think an underestimated way, an, an extraordinary level of, um, influence over the, uh, home IT, not, not specifically as a jump point, but, you know, for example, in our RSA talk, we showed an example of how we can trick a machine that's VPN connected, um, into accepting a different route to a um, RDP server. So the, the, the thing is configured so that your traffic, your internal network should be going via the, via, via the, the VPN. What we do is using DHCP, we inject another route into the PC's configuration mm. and cause it to route, route traffic that should be going through the VPN directly to our network connect, connected Linux device and then capture, and then capture creds. And you know we already probably have like ten use cases like that where you abuse elements of DHCP to attack home uh, PCs. And I haven't really seen it in the wild, but I, I think it's an interesting element that is not being thought about. You know, when, when we think about our corporate um, enterprise security models, and this is an example of of how that sort of thing could happen. You know, how that initial access could happen. Super interesting, and you're you're absolutely right. I think. Because so much of the news cycles are dominated by things like ransomware, and that's like, you know, usually a phishing attack or something like that, or, or, or what have you, social engineering to get that. Um, you know, that's kind of like where all the focus goes because, oh, that's actual impact, you know, downtime, actual financial loss that can be seen. And, um, you know, these sorts of things are often ignored. 
So, so mm. in the grand scheme of things, I think organizations, they need to really think about this hybrid environment that a lot of organizations are adopting going forward and take take into account some of these, these risks when they're architecting their, their future solutions. Otherwise, they're gonna, it's gonna be the same old problem all over again. They're gonna yeah. architect something now, and then oh, we we just inherited these risks. Okay, let let's just keep going and uh, until we <laughs> until we're forced to up to, uh, to change stuff. Well, that yeah. that's going to be tough because how do you control what's on a person's home network when they're VPNing well, exactly. years, right? Mm, how exactly. do you control that sort of thing? How do you know if some kid's been playing games on that laptop during the day and now they connect, and you know they were installing some sort of cheats or some sort of garbage that that's in there, and you know. That's a tough one to get through. I mean, we have enough trouble with MDM on on people's phones. Now we're talking mm -hmm. about their whole home networks. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting time. I, I think it's a really interesting problematic. And you know, my my sense is that we we find ourselves in this weird um, interim phase now, where businesses are accepting, you know, hybrid work from home realities. Overwhelmingly, we know that that's going to be the case, and. By extension, we're accepting a dependence on their home IT, right? We're, we're, we're expecting that the user has Wi-Fi, maintains it, keeps it going, you know, looks after it in, in some way. And then what we do is, because we understand that's not secure, we, we, we're trying to use VPNs to create this sort of security equivalency, right? So to kind of make the remotely connected endpoint equivalently secure to the, to the LAN connected endpoint. I'm not sure that that holds. I'm not sure that that's attainable, um, you know, with reasonable costs and and, and overheads. And I've been talking a lot to people about the idea of, you, you know, shipping Wi-Fi dongles to your users, for example. You know, just take like the home network out of the equation. If they're working from a home and that's now an extension of your environment, then, you know, pony up, pay for it. Um, because this weird kind of false economy of, you know, the users paying for their own Wi-Fi and maintaining it, uh, it feels like a way of accruing security debt, if, if you ask me. You know, yeah. it, and I don't mean to, to keep going on this, Javad, or to cut you off, but one of the things I was thinking about here is um, with this hybrid environment, what I haven't heard a lot of, and I've heard a lot about VPNs and stuff, but not a lot of uh, of NAX sort of things. Like when I was in the Army, we had um, a network access control solution we were working with that would basically take machines that when you connected, they had to meet a certain patch level. They had to have certain um, antivirus running. They had to have certain, you, you could set up certain things that would even allow them to access a network. Otherwise they were quarantined into their own little segment until these things were completed or done. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that as we've moved to this hybrid model or even heard a lot of talk about that. It's mostly about no. you fire up a VPN and boom, you're, you're basically in our network or you know, the wise people bring it to a jump box or something like that that's not directly within the network, um, if they can. But have you heard anything about NAC solutions becoming more popular through this? No, um, and, and and when we mention that kind of thinking, uh, sort of overwhelmingly, uh, you just presented with all the logistical challenges, you know, how would we ship it? How would we afford it? Uh, and again, I, I, I kind of feel like it's a fake economy. I think people feel like that's cheap, that's expensive. But rolling out, you know, layers and layers of security controls via software somehow isn't. Um, but you know, you get you get nice gadgets. You get these um, device-based SD WAN appliances that yep. can be centrally managed. That um, put out a, a Wi-Fi AP that can be compliant without whatever your you know Leap or EAP um, protocols are. Strongly authenticate the end user. Implement a VPN tunnel. Um, you know, put whatever other controls you want. I like that as a solution. It strikes me as being really compelling. But a very small number of people that I've spoken to, we did a poll that was like between 15 and 30 percent, or even thinking in that uh, in that direction. For most people, it's just sort of an out of hand no. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's. Uh, I think we're building a, a problem for ourselves there. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Very interesting. Well, I'm not. I'm, I don't think we're going to get to the answer today, but we ask the important <laughs> questions and leave uh, the, the audience pondering on that. And a final story of the day before we move on to our discussion is um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, has um, 
published bad practices. Uh, Eric, you found this. Uh, they, they've provided some comprehensive, complete security advice of what's bad practice. Uh, can you talk us through some of these? Yes, to in order to secure um, government systems, you, you need to be aware of these um, two bad practices, both of them, two of them. And then if you if you tackle that, apparently you're good. Now, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> they are going to add to this. And, and you know, as much as I want to make fun of it, um, at least they're kind of doing something and starting there. They do say they're going to continue to add to it. I really think without a whole lot of work, they probably could have come up with more than just two to begin with. Right. Um, who knows? Whatever. You know, um, it, it is good to see at least that they're putting some direction. And so the two here, you know, don't use end of life support where uh, software, you know, stuff that can't be patched or EOL stuff. Well, that's probably not a bad idea, right? And uh, use of known fixed or default passwords and creds in service of these things, probably a bad idea. These are not revolutionary ideas or thoughts, right? And, and I seriously hope that anyone that would be impacted by this list already knows these things. However, again, like I said, who knows, maybe in six months, it'll be, you know, 350 things long and it's all great ideas. And this is the new framework by which the world revolves. I don't know. But you saw it here first on the jury yeah. show. <laughs> I think that there's this interesting bullet point right at the end. This list is focused and does not include every impossible, inadvisable cybersecurity practice. Um, so, um, so, so we have to bear that in mind. And, and I think it's an interesting challenge, though, because, like you said, none of this is revolutionary. It's all been captured in many other standards and and, and advice out there. So you could pick up any of the NIST guidance, the ISO twenty seven thousand one, or even PCI would would have like some some of these things in there. Um, so, so where do it, it's a delicate balance because you want to give people something usable and useful, but you don't want to turn it into a 350 page framework uh, because then you might as well just refer to one of the existing frameworks. So so I guess it's it's a bit like, well, what are you trying to achieve and who's the audience really? I, I, I'm a bit confused uh, because like it's, it's regulatory sort of pressures which will move the needle the most, unfortunately. Um, and then anyone that's actually invested in security um, will probably refer to something that's a bit more robust. But you know where I, I see some things on this, Javad, is you know coming out of the government sector where I worked for a long time in the DoD. Oh, here um, we go again. Oh, jeez, here we go. No, um, but this can give people some, I don't know, some teeth, if you will. Like if they if they see this, they can go back to their folks and go, "I told you we need to upgrade this software. We can't continue to run this old crap." Now you got to approve it because CISA says it's bad. It's not just me saying it. So that's where I could see this having a little bit of, of value. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, I, I find it. I find the whole thing quite peculiar. I, I, I keep thinking in the back of my mind that you know, Chris Krebs would be rolling in his in his uh, <laughs> proverbial <laughs> government grave. Um, it, it just sort of all looks like half baked. You know, even the formatting. You know, the, the list is kind of all compressed. Um, it, it, the URL is strange. I mean, it just seems like it's kind of half baked, you know, like <laughs> maybe it snuck out before it was ready or something. Yeah. yeah. Where's a matrix? Where's something like that? Come on. Yeah, it needs a matrix. It's got to have a matrix. <laughs> Come on. We got to put a matrix on there or something, right? <laughs> something that, that resembles a, a spreadsheet, please. Yeah. Or a bad practice code, you know, bad practice. Twenty twenty one zero zero one, right? Or make an acronym out of it, right? Or an acronym, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so at the end, there's this. Was this web page helpful? <laughs> yes, somewhat or no? What shall I click on? Let's let it go for now. Let's give them a chance to uh, maybe re revisit this in a couple of months, Javad, and see if they've improved this at all. Maybe they've had a third one. Um, I, I, I'm just going to go for no. To be honest, I'm just going to go for it. I, look, and, I think um, you've, you've, you've filled the full five-minute segment of your show talking about it. So in that sense, yes. I think it was immensely oh. useful. Now you've okay. done it. Oh, <laughs> Okay. I, I, I will, I will go. <laughs> that wasn't me. Anyway, that was a new segment of the show. 
Um, remember, you can follow us on um, your favorite podcast app as well. If you don't want to see our beautiful faces on YouTube, it, you can go to the Jared Show Podbean um, or find it in iTunes or whatever. Uh, you can follow Eric and I on Twitter and Charles as well. Uh, our handles are there on screen unless you're listening to the podcast in which case uh, too bad or just follow at the Jarrett show on twitter and you'll get told when and where there are new uh, features uh anyway we have got Charles, who's our star guest of the day who's already provided far more insight into the stories than uh, and value than Eric and I have provided in the last six months uh so if you haven't guessed uh Charles is is a is a technical person. If you haven't heard of Sense Post and OCD, then they they are one of the uh, the gold standards in in the in the research they've consistently provided over many many years. It's not just a, a one off, and and it's always been useful. Bunch of their guys always um, and girls they they do uh, training courses uh, around the world, like you, you you might see them in Black Hat and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, <laughs> So, um, Charles, welcome to the show. And uh, you were the CEO of Sense Post. And then what happened? Were, were you were you merged? Were you acquired by Orange, or was it a rebrand? Uh, and how did that happen? And what do you do now? Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, I, I was I was one of the founders back in in two thousand, um, together with a guy I think many people may have come across called Rulof Temming, who who went on to found or develop the Multigo software that's very, very you know, popular with uh, uh, our center. I, I think we're having some issues here. Are we having oh. technical issues, Javad? Is it just me? No, I, I think Charles is roboting for me and as well. we then... We, we kind of... Okay, so I just messaged him so that he can see it too. I don't know if he's hearing our audio right now, but obviously we're having some connection issues there. In the meantime, Javad, tell us a funny joke or something while we wait for this to kind of recover. So it reminds me of a story I read a few years ago in South Africa where they had a race to transfer like 10 gigs of data across their internet versus putting data on a pigeon and flying it across and the pigeon beat the internet data transfer so i think that's evidenced here by Shaw now completely um yeah. Up. Now, now, wasn't there a uh, wasn't there an RFC on that? Like, um, it was uh, IP or or internet by uh, carrier pigeon. Wasn't there an RFC for that a long time ago? Do you remember that one? I don't remember that one. But uh, now you mention it, it sort of like feels familiar. But I, I, I can't remember that one. Oh no, we we got to the best part. And uh, okay, let's see if we can get Shaw back. Hello, Shaw. Hey guys, sorry. Uh, That's all right. No worries. No worries. Uh, as soon as you started talking, you started to 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 robot and and lag. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was like that. We did a anyway. horrible job filling in for you, um, but uh, you're back now, so we're we're glad to hear it. Um, you know, still kind of want to hear a little bit more about uh, what happened there, but you, you died almost immediately when you started talking yes. about that. So if you so, want to, if you want to redo everything again, like when Javad forgets to hit um, record on this show and we have to redo <laughs> it, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the question was uh, just a little bit about the the transition, right? Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd been a part of the the kind of founding team along with a guy called Rulof Temming. Who, who later went on to uh, create the Multigo software, which is very popular with uh, the, the Ascent crowd. Um, and Rulof left after about seven years, and uh, you know, I carried on uh, running the show as best as I could. Um, 
And then in around 2012, I think it was, um, it, was, it, was it was sort of a long and boring series of transactions, but effectively we, we eventually got acquired by a company called Orange Cyber Defense. Um, and Orange Cyber Defense was or is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of Orange Mobile, uh, which is kind of one of the big um, you know, mobile network players. They had made a strategic decision to move into cybersecurity as kind of one of their key plays and had, had sort of spun off this independent uh, business arm, uh, which was effectively constructed from a series of acquisitions. Uh, first, a company called Nexi in, um, in France, and then Alexi, sorry, not Nexi, and then uh, a company called Secure Data in the UK, a company called Secure Link in Sweden, and us. Um, and since since then, they've sort of been working to, you know, crunch all of that into a kind of cohesive operating uh, entity. And as part of that um, transition, I, I had a role for a while managing a um, what they call a cyber sock, like a threat managed threat detection operation, you know, manage CM that sort of thing. And then eventually, in February last year, ironically, like literally as the first wave of COVID happened, uh, I got moved into this uh, into this new position, uh, which is to head up a, a dedicated security team within um, within our cyber defense. Um, and uh, the guy who had been our CTO up to then as a, a gent by the name of uh, Dominic White, goes by the handle of Singe, he, he took over as CEO or managing director, uh, and is in fact now managing director for uh, Orange Cyber Defense operations in South Africa generally, so you got a bit of a uh, kick up the ladder. Also, that's the that's the story in a in a nutshell. So uh, here's a question for you. You know, when when you started your own thing, uh, the entrepreneurial way, right? The entrepreneurial spirit. What made you decide I want to go be a co-founder because it's going to be fun? I'm going to get to like party all the time, be on yachts. Um, there's no work involved because I'm an executive, right? Is that what went through your mind? And then you said, hey, let's go make this real. I think the dominating um, factor was probably hubris uh, at, at the time. But, um, you know, this was, I mean, this sort of got conceptualized in 1999. Um, and there were there were a couple of things happening. The, the one was that Ruloff and I both worked for this like state-owned business in South Africa, you know, very deep tech uh, state-owned business that was doing things like, uh, you know, developing hardware, developing crypto algorithms uh, initially for the state and for defense, and then later for, uh, you know, for banks and other commercial enterprises. And it was a very exciting, very rewarding, uh, challenging place to work, you know, really smart, interesting people, all with South African accents. Uh, we spoke Afrikaans, all of us, we didn't speak English with each other. Um, and they then got acquired, and in that acquisition, um, the you know the ethos changed, the culture changed, a lot of politics came into it, and things got shut down that we believed in, and things got started that we didn't like, and so we'd, we'd kind of made a decision we wanted out from that. And Ruloff and I had been kind of collectively examining all the the options, you know, that they, that there were, and um, and to tell you the honest, brutal truth we went out to a Mexican restaurant and probably got a little drunk on tequila. And at one point it just kind of dawned on me. I said, you know, if you, if you want to, if you want to have a clear trajectory for the, for, you know, the next phase in your career, given all of this uncertainty, the, the way to do it is to make certainty. So, you know, let's do our own, let's do our own thing. But it was also, you know, it was sort of at the height of the dot com bubble, you know, people were becoming squillionaires everywhere. We were we were young. We were unmarried. Um, you know, we didn't have a cent to our names, so it didn't feel like there was much to lose either. You, you know, it kind of figured, well, we'll give this a whirl, and um, maybe it works out, and maybe it doesn't. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, we'll go and work for one of the you know network integrators or something. I wish I wish I could I wish I could say something more uh, you know profound and Yoda esque, but that's honestly, well, you started with. 
you started with we did this because of tequila so that's yeah. that's hmm. pretty profound right there i mean that <laughs> that says a lot um, it really it was does. fueled by tequila yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well i'm sure i mean a lot of people that want to start their own business for for those that are interested in taking that path and becoming a ceo of something like what's what's one key thing that you would say that surprised you that you think may surprise someone else that thinks you know hey i'm going for the brass ring um, if we're talking about surprise, I would say freedom. You know, I, I, you, you go into it thinking that you're plotting your own path, you're choosing your own way, you're, you're creating autonomy for yourself, you're going to have, you know, all the self-determination. But, but in the end, you, you sort of end up working for, um, you end up working for the customer and for the taxpayer and for the auditor and you know in in some ways this sort of year and a half that i've been in this role now working for a big corporate i, I found it immensely liberating i can just get to focus on my work um i can be good at what i'm supposed to be good at instead of being good at everything um i you know i i, I suspect i might get bored of it at some point but you know after decades of you know that kind of pressure that kind of actually lack of autonomy you know i i'm sort of really enjoying being able to go on vacation and you know it's this amazing thing we use outlook now i never had outlook before you use outlook and you, you push a button and it says i'm out of office and then people just leave you alone they just leave you alone it's like magic i never, I never had that before so I, nice. I think that's the thing that surprised me the most um you know the beginning phases were really euphoric we were plotting our own course you know we knew where we were going we were going to do it differently to everyone else um and you know, as a young technical person, I got to explore and understand things that I never thought that I would. Uh, but there comes a point, you know, where you've actually got people working for you, and you've got bills to pay and creditors, and where you realize oh, I'm not sure that I'm actually that f that free. Certainly, I can't hit the out of office button on my email anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, so one thing that that uh, I was thinking about this before you came on, I thought when when I think of South Africa, I don't really think of a massive uh cyber security um industry uh just generally as someone that's never been to south africa i i mean i i think i know three three entities one's anna collard who was our coll colleague I, I think you know she she founded mm. she's one of the founders of popcorn training there's uh haroon mir and the guys at thinks canary mm -hmm. and then there's sense post um but you 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 managed to to build a, a team there consistently over many years that has been highly technical and produced great research. Uh, where do you find these people? Because apparently there's a massive shortage of, of skills and talents everywhere in the world, but uh, you, you, you've been really good at not finding people or developing people. I mean, what's been the the, the, the secret to, to your success? Well, we kidnapped them really. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's a huge cyber human trafficking <laughs> ring on the back end. Um, Javad, no, you know, it's it's a good question. And, and you know, I, I, I mentioned right at the beginning of the show, South Africa is, um, it's very dichotomous, right? We, we have all these different realities. Um, and in the in the sort of place, the milieu and the time that, that Ruloff and I emerged, um, actually, uh, South Africa had quite a deep well of technical skills. You know, doing, doing apartheid a little bit like the Israelis, you know, we, we, we were constantly in conflict, or we thought we were. Uh, there's a lot of investment by the state in, into defense and into uh, skills development and education for the, you know, select few. Um, and so in, in many ways, that investment did create quite a, um, maybe an unusually stable base from which to build. And, and you mentioned those three companies, but of course, there's uh, Terva and the Multigo crowd also, um, and and several others that that did uh, unusually well, I think, given the the size of the economy and the um, uh, you know the other disadvantages to to, to being based so so far away. Um, so we weren't completely at a at a disadvantage in terms of skills and experience. Plus, um, you know, we have a very developed uh, technology ecosystem. Mobile is huge here. Banking, electronic banking, is very well developed. Uh, and if you're in cybersecurity, we have a we have a propensity for crime, um, which created a you know some some really nice opportunities uh, for us. I, I feel like in some forms of crime we're way ahead of the curve. You know, <laughs> um, 
so so there was that but in the sense post context um how did we how did we do it so so there were pickings and we you know we could find graduates uh still some good universities producing uh you know good computer science uh graduates or business science or whatever you would want to want to pick from um then i think we we grew at a pace that we could that we could maintain so so we always considered ourselves to be a resource driven rather than a demand driven business so rather than saying how much business can we um you know kick up the question was how many good people can we find and then we could project what our you know what our revenues and profits and stuff could be from from there so we always resource constrained um and and although i think we we made a lot of mistakes and we didn't always get it right we we then learned to be very selective uh in in who we asked to join the team you know ranging from you know informal methodologies that we tried to very formal methodologies you know we we tried a lot of things but got better and better at it um and then being very loyal once we'd um appointed someone so you know it's uh, resourcing is like sales you have a funnel you want to know that you can you can find people to come in but you also want to hold on to them as long as you possibly possibly can and so we worked very hard to create an environment that was financially rewarding but mostly i think allowed people to feel that they had a sense of purpose they knew what they were doing they were contributing in some meaningful way they were respected they were given room they were supported um and then you know i had a business coach at one point that said to me that the secret to success is just being right more often than you're wrong um so it's not like any of these things were you know magic silver bullets it's just um over a sufficient amount of time you you get to find and hang on to a few better people and lose you know a few not so good people and if you're not being too ambitious with your um expansion then uh the the, the net result is that you end up with a good team I'm going to go out on a limb here too and say, you know, if you're hiring people, did, did you require a CISSP? Because I'm assuming if you don't require a CISSP, you pretty much open up like two thirds more of the market of good people <laughs> to be able yeah. to work for you, right? No, yeah, we never required a CISSP, and in fact, um, you know, qualifications in general were very low down on our list of um, of criteria. I will tell you a funny story though. Uh, Harun Mia and I were. Probably amongst the, the the very first South Africans to sit for our CISSP, and uh, we both came out of the exam completely rattled. You know, in like yeah. neither of us <laughs> thought or believed for a moment that we could have passed. And then we compared notes on all the contentious questions, and we had different answers on all of them. Right? I'd gone with B, he'd gone with C, then he went with D, I went with E, uh, and so it was clear that neither of us could have passed. You know, and um, at least one of us couldn't have passed. And then we both did. And I'm still confused to this day how that how that worked out. Since we those were sample questions for everything. <laughs> those were the trial <laughs> questions, right? Um, no, I, for baselining. I, I remember after mine too. Um, I, I did mine in uh, Arizona actually, and uh, took the exam. And I drove around the corner to this wonderful Mexican food restaurant and just stared at a wall for a while because <laughs> yeah. I was just so mentally drained. Um, there was nothing I was going to be able to do after that. And I still yeah. had a 65 mile drive home. So I just stared at a wall for about 45 minutes and I was good. Javad, you, you've got your CISSP, right? Dude, my CISSP. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for some reason, I'm fortunate that I've always been pretty good at exams in the sense that I don't really get stressed by them and I can do just enough to pass. So the the CISSP, I just done practice exams for about three months before the, the actual exam. So when I sat the exam, I was actually done within like two hours. And this was like a six hour exam, I think, or something. It, yeah. was, it was really long. I was the first, I, I, I sat there for a while, just flipping over the paper, sure that I'd missed something because everyone was still in the hall. Uh, in the end, I got up and I was like, well, I'm done. And uh, yeah, that I, I apparently passed as well. So yeah, they'll pass anyone these days, I suppose, <laughs> or back in the day. Yeah. Eric, maybe to respond to your question in a different way, we, we, we certainly wouldn't have required a CISSP to hire anybody, uh, neither any kind of qualification. Um, we also, at, at 
eventually um, kind of really invested very heavily into this, uh, you know, grow your own wood uh, idea. Uh, so we ran a we run an academy that uh, brings people in from, you know, whatever diverse uh, backgrounds, diverse walks of life. Um, and we put them through a, what's effectively a sponsored internship um, at the at the beginning and at the end of which they get it they get evaluated and then um, you know we sort of pick the, the cream of the crop from there. Um, but to 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 the sort of you know slightly uh, facetious um, tone of CSSP, I, I I still recommend it to people you know yeah. and and particularly I recommend it to people you know like from SensePost who have spent so much time, you know, focused and obsessing about this one, one element. Uh, I, I think it's, it's decent. I, I think it's worth doing for your, for yourself. I wouldn't, you know, hire or not hire somebody on that basis, but um, I wouldn't recommend against it. So as the former director of member relations and services at ISC squared, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, hey, I do no, foot in mouth like, disease. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Because I agree with you 100%. My only issue with the certification actually is the gatekeeping that happens out there where good people are disqualified from roles because they just can't get past that first place. Mm. And, and that's not just with that cert, that's with certs in general, right? Mm. I love what you talked about, about taking people from the inside and, you know, grow your own wood sort of thing and taking those people that have promise and interest and, you know, those skills and then helping with that. And I wish more organizations would do that internally with their people. We run around, we scream all the time about how we can't hire security people. And you have a bunch of people in there that are like, I would love to get into security. You know, I would love to do this. And we've had a number of guests on our show that what, two of them now have come out of theater, right, Javad? And, and worked yeah. into cybersecurity. Very smart people. And, and you know, they were lucky enough to be able to get into that. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, and, and I was just giving you a hard time about the cert part of things because, well, let, let's do that. But it is true. There's a lot of very qualified people out there that don't necessarily qualify for one of those certs or they can't afford the six, 700 bucks to go take the test. And but they're very, very good people. And we have to keep our eyes open for that kind of stuff. I really think we do. Like you, I recommend it to people, too, especially if they're wanting to move up and into management, because at least, you know, to your point, they've been exposed to a whole lot of different things. And that's the problem when you get so focused on something. The CISSP tells me that you've at least understood at a point of time that you know about all of these different things. And it's a little bit more mm -hmm. rounded than just I do app stuff. That's it. So, yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Agreed 100 percent. Yeah. OK, Javad. Cool. So, so uh, I, I suppose sticking to that, that theme, um, for people that are looking to try and break into the industry, what advice would you give them? Is it, you know, focus on something technical, do your own research? Is it something more about understand the, the management side? I suppose, th th I mean, there are many routes into the industry, but I suppose mm. what's one of your favorite, favorite ones which you think will give people a good foundation? Yeah, I've, after all these years, I, f I find this question so hard to answer. Um, and maybe it's because, you know, honestly, when I applied for my first job at that company with Rulof, um, I was a snotty nose, punk head skater. Honestly, I didn't bother to lace my shoes for the interview. I would never have hired me today. Um, and for whatever reason, they hired me. And um, I've never applied for a job since. And I've literally worked for the same uh, legal entity since then. So. I, I'm, I'm poorly positioned to answer the question, um, but I, I mean, I think the first thing I would counsel people is is think about the why, like what do you think you're going to get from from this, um, and then think about the and then think about the where. You know, you know obviously through my exposure, I, I see people drawn very much to the pen testing, the red team side. Um, and it, it has its advantages as a definite draw there. Um, but I think it's it's sort of over overestimated, you know, as a as a branch of, of security. Um, and I, I think one kind of goes there perhaps a little bit at your peril because it forces you into a very particular way of thinking, which I which I think is not always right 
for for everyone. Um, so I think that would be my first advice is, is kind of think about what it is that you want from this as a, as a career path um, and try and be as honest with yourself as you can. Because, you know, yeah, the, the, the sort of glamour of the pen testing side or the glamour of the, you know, internet response side is, um, it definitely comes with its catches. Uh, and I'm not sure that's necessarily the route. Um, and then, you, you know, if you, if you get a foot in the door, for me, I would say um, the keys to success are um, perseverance. You, you know, like at security, you, you, you kind of just have to work hard, just like, um, you know, like in any other d domain. I don't think there's any kind of secret. There's no magic sauce. I've got this model, um, I won't bore you with it, but I've got this model of, of almost like personal development. Uh, that I share with people. And it starts with this idea of like mastering your domain, really understanding it, you know, at its at its core, what is it that we're trying to do here? And then moving through these various phases, like through um, formalizing that, you know, via documentation, can you communicate what you do to other people? And then scaling it via, by enabling other people, you know, can I make what I do, um, can I multiply it by enabling other people to do it and then understanding like um, the purpose of what I do how, how does my mastery of this skill contribute to the to the business or the organization's overall uh, goals you know how do I can, can I express that do I understand it um, and then getting all the way to the point where you understand the, the, the way you contribute to kind of the well-being of society in general um, and, and and at that at that point, I think you're capable. You're in a position to influence leadership and influence policymakers, etc. Um, so I, I guess my my point is that, that feels to me like a that, that feels to me like the sort of journey you would have in any discipline. You know, the, those are the steps that you have to follow um, to succeed. And then I think the the the, the career path I, I think may surprise you. You know, it it it, it, it comes at you from different directions, um, and I don't know that I'm equipped to advise on exactly, you know, what route to take uh, to get in or to um, or to move forward. But I think those attributes, that approach to working, um, is is useful. And oh, and and my catchphrase at SensePost always because um, I like to uh, um, underpay in the beginning <laughs> was uh, I used to tell people that's not true, uh, but I used to tell people learn before you earn. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and one of the things that that frustrates me now is um, this really high demand for instant gratification that you see from uh, from young entrants. You know, people are like, I've been in a job for a year, what's next? And I'm, you know, and I'm like, well, if you're in a job for a year, you know, you're, you're barely out of, uh, you've barely let go of your training wheels. What's next <laughs> is you get good at what you do. But yeah. um, that patience seems to be lacking. You know, people, people kind of want to get the big numbers early. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's worth uh, taking your time and then moving strategically, because you do want to move to earn more money and to get better opportunities. Um, maybe one more thing I would add, although it kind of really goes against the, the spirit at SensePost, um, is I, I would recommend to people to move companies strategically. So not often, but um, I do think that a, you know if you work with a specific team, a specific company, it creates a kind of a mold for you that's very hard to grow out of. Um, and uh, I think it is strategically useful to, to to jump ship every now and again and put yourself in a new context and let people rediscover you, give yourself an opportunity to redefine yourself. That's a great point. I mean, you know, in InfoSec, there's so many niches and so many different directions you can go to. If you stick with one, then it's really easy to just be that one thing when you may find something else you really like. Now, obviously, you have a bit of a background in research and such. Um, I think that's, you know, one of the things that you enjoy doing as I understand. So tell me a little bit about like, what, what's your uh, what's your favorite research over the years? And we're gonna do this in kind of a speed question here because we got a few minutes we need to wrap up here, but what's your favorite thing that you've done research on or researched? Oh man, you know, I, I'm gonna tell you the story of what I'm working on now because it's, it's, it's tickling me. Um, we, I, I've got a, a, a member of my team who's a criminologist. It's a thing. You can study crime, like not how to do it, but, you know, how it works. <laughs> and, um, 
I've been working with her to look at the problem of ransomware through some of the theoretical frameworks that criminologists use to understand crime. And, and, I'm, and I've got a whole lot of things on the boil. You know, we're, we're looking at COBOL strike. We're looking at sense posts, pen testing data. I've got, uh, you know, ransomware leak sites. It's like all kinds of things are going on. But this thing I find really interesting. And I think the reason is because it's giving me an opportunity to step out of a world that I, that I really know well. We use the same language, the same biases, the same whatever, <laughs> and, and really look at the problem through a completely different perspective. And, and realize, wow, you know, there's decades of thought and research and arguing and, you know, whatever that's happened to understand a problem that's very similar to ours. Um, but we, we have none of it. I mean, when did anybody, you know, talk to you about neutralization theory or uh, routine activity theory or, you know, the, these are all like the academics fight about which one is more applicable. You know, there's the guys who have been like in one camp for a decade and they're fighting with the guys in the other camp for a decade. We don't know anything about it. So I think those are the things that I find probably the most intriguing is, is when you get to kind of step out of a particular rut and, and look at yourself and your problems through another um, viewpoint. And the moment for me, it's criminology. I find it immensely rewarding. That's a great point. And, and you know, it, it's something that I, I fully subscribe to that so many of the so-called new day problems or challenges that we see in security are are just old day old day problems they're just applied in a different context of technology and so we we tend to think of things through that technology lens but there's so much we can learn like you said criminology is a great great example but then there's 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 uh, all this stuff done around marketing and advertising and uh, you know human behavior that you know is so applicable and so many yeah. of us fall into the trap of trying to re reinvent the wheel and uh, yeah. think, or, or, or trying to think of it only in terms of like it's a it's a security problem so yeah uh, i'll tell you just very briefly something else i really enjoyed on that journey is uh, we presented the first draft of our paper to a to a very established renowned academic at leeds university actually uh, and we asked him to review it and I, I haven't gotten a hiding like that in a long time and it was it was actually really rewarding to, to be schooled by someone, you know, in a in a sort of firm but gentle way. Um, because you know, if you've been in this game for for as long as we all have, you, you're kind of used to being, I don't know, you know, the smartest kid in the class or one of them, or you're in the the A stream or whatever. Um, and I, I find it really an enjoyable experience to be taken down a notch, you know, by by someone. <laughs> That's that's fantastic. That that's great. Um, you you um, Eric, you you like getting a hiding on the weekends and getting taken down, <laughs> the rush, don't you? Right, right. Uh huh. Um, I got to tell you, you know what? This is this has been a great episode, and you know we learned some really important things today. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Um, so thank you very much, Eric, for your input as always. Uh, Shaw, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, I really learned a lot. I, I, I think you know your, your insights and uh, your, your your knowledge and wisdom is something that you know everyone can learn a lot from. So thank you so much for giving up your time and, and joining us here. Tiva, that's really kind, and thanks for having me. I've, I've had an I've had an awesome time. Um, I'd love to be back. It was it's, it's been the most fun I've had all week. Yes, we'd love to have you back, and uh, hopefully. Once the world opens up again, we can meet in person. May, may, who knows? Maybe ne next Ramadan, I'll, I'll try to come over to Cape Town for the shorter <laughs> days. <laughs> I'll find you a place with as little sun as possible. Fantastic. <laughs> cool. With that, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will be back next week. Uh, or will we? Well, one of us will be. Uh, I'll leave it as a surprise. So uh, until next week, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>